Joining us now, Phyllis Chesler, author of the book, An American Bride in Kabul. Phyllis, we have appreciated our past visits, uh, your insight uh, and uh, your own experiences. We begin very briefly in the time we have. Uh, give us your story, what happened to you uh, earlier in life. Uh, when I was very young, I married a man from Afghanistan, very westernized. We went to Kabul for a visit. I was trapped there. I had no idea what I was walking into. This was purda, this was polygamy, and this was constant pressure to convert to Islam. Now, I was lucky I got out, but I learned that these barbaric customs are not caused by the West or by foreign influence. They're very indigenous. Now, just as I was naive and I wanted a grand adventure and thought that nothing harmful could come to me, I think these young Western girls, maybe some uh, naive and some for other reasons, which we'll go into, are being lured by the East with false promises and not checking at all as to what the real life of a Muslim wife, if she's lucky, would be among barbaric jihadists. And I say, if she's lucky, because if she's lucky, she'll just be beaten daily, and she'll be forced to have numerous pregnancies and give birth under very high-risk primitive conditions, and uh, she'll have to be fully veiled in the hottest weather possible. So with the two minutes that remains, Phyllis, you're concerned that this rise of Islamist extremists is going to result in women going over there, young women uh, under misimpressions of what they will face and uh, and what happens there. My partner alongside uh, Miranda Khan, her parents met in Kabul under a very different situation very in different. terms of being more westernized. Right, we're talking about the late 60s, early 70s. How, you know, when this happened to you, Phyllis, if you don't mind me asking, when was this? 1961. And, and, and you felt that then, that you were yeah, being- this was yeah, pre-Taliban. My husband was very sophisticated and very Western. Right. You have to understand that. But his family was not, and his country and culture were not, and people who shared his beliefs, if they're lucky, they now live in exile. Well, Phyllis, because they have Phyllis, to flee. Not to interrupt, but I, what do women, you know, in this day and age, what do they need to look out for? How are they being lured over there and into this? jihadist well, realm as you would put it because women who are either mentally ill or bored or trying to escape from dysfunctional families in the west are going to be jumping from the frying pan into the fire also women like men who convert to islam want structure they don't want western freedom they don't want choices they want to be told what to do and they believe falsely that if they follow the rules, they'll be rewarded. And Phyllis, on that note, obviously there is more to talk about on this subject. You lived it personally. We will bring you back as we continue to monitor these websites. We thank you so much for your time Skyping in from New York. Uh, we need thank to you. shift gears now. The year 1957, the place Little Rock, Arkansas, in this American moment. The 1954 U.S. Supreme Court's decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, declared all laws establishing segregated schools to be unconstitutional. As with the majority of Southern cities, Little Rock, Arkansas's Board of Education agreed to comply with the court's ruling. However, Arkansas's Governor Orville Faubus had other ideas. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. President Eisenhower was so disturbed by the governor's decision to completely ignore federal law, he cut short his vacation and returned to the White House to address the nation. The president's responsibility is inescapable. In accordance with that responsibility, I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. At the center of the controversy were nine black students selected by the Little Rock School Board
to attend the then all-white Central High School. One of the students, Elizabeth Eckford, arrived at the school separately and found herself confronting an angry crowd of students and bystanders. Suddenly, out of that crowd, as seen here, an older white woman came to her rescue and guided her safely to a bus. Even after the nine students were admitted to Central High, the year that followed found them being subjected to taunts and abuses, both verbal and physical, by student and parent alike. Well, I think, like, if a, a Spanish or a Chinese person came here, it wouldn't be hard to get along with them. It's just that the Negroes are, what you might say, more different to us than a Spanish person might be. However, with the admittance of those brave students on the 25th day of September, 1957, the precedent had been set. And soon afterward, all of Little Rock schools voluntarily complied with the court's rulings, and planned school segregation became part of a troubled past. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.